You may have heard it said that there are seven basic plots. Every novel we read, every movie we see, and every story we write tends to align itself with one of these seven basic plots. Now, the storylines change dramatically. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a very different tale than Lord of the Rings, but they both fall under the umbrella heading of The Quest. Aladdin and My Fair Lady are two very different examples of the basic plot known as rags to riches. Now, what exactly do we mean by plot? Aristotle defined plot as a series of events accompanied by a change in fortune. Traditionally, that chain of events begins with a good opening setup that establishes the status quo. A middle filled with interesting conflict and a satisfying ending. I like the old adage that says, to write a novel, you put your hero up a tree, you throw rocks at him for 200 pages, and then you bring him down. That analogy sums up pretty much every story. Before we look at each of these seven basic plots in depth, let's quickly go through them. They are Overcoming the Monster, Rags to Riches, The Quest, Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, and Rebirth. Perhaps you've already thought of examples of these plots. You might even be considering that many stories involve crossover of one or more of them, and that would be accurate. But by and large, the main theme of most stories are going to point to one of these seven. So who determined that these seven basic plots cover the entire gamut of every story ever written? English journalist and editor Christopher Booker literally wrote the book on the subject. He spent 34 years researching and writing this 700-page classic. It goes into great depth with fascinating insights into storytelling as well as the reasonings behind it. So let's take a closer look at these seven basic plots one by one. And while they each have distinct differences, they also share a number of characteristics. The five we're going to consider are key aspects of what we call the hero's journey. First, the call to action, the inciting event that leads the hero toward their adventure. The mentor, the person who guides the hero or is the moral compass of the story. Tests and trials, these are the challenges that fill the middle of the story. They could also be the fun and games, the reason the audience comes for the story. They want to see what happens, how this plot plays out. The final confrontation, that face-to-face -face fight with the enemy. And resolution, the reward. Our first basic plot is overcoming the monster. This isn't necessarily a literal monster, but rather a bigger-than-life threat to the hero or his world. It can be anything from Godzilla to a rival sports team or a cruel boss. We've seen the hero overcoming monsters in stories like Beowulf, Dracula, Star Wars, the Harry Potter series, and the James Bond movies with their supervillains. To illustrate overcoming the monster and those five heroes' journey elements, let's consider one of the most famous disaster stories of all time. In Peter Benchley's Jaws, Chief Brody is a mild-mannered police chief who takes a job in a sleepy seashore town. He doesn't expect anything exciting to happen. His call to action is a literal phone call telling him about a shark attack. Having had no prior experience with sharks, Chief Brody is a fish out of water who's going to need some guidance. The mentor who comes to help is gruff but lovable, as many mentors are. Quint is a grizzled old man of the sea who shows them the ropes and has his own vendetta against sharks. The bulk of the story is the tests and trials middle. Complications include the town council not wanting to close the beach during tourist season, fake sharks, and another shark attack. 
At one point, it looks like someone caught the shark, but it was the wrong shark. The real challenge they face becomes evident once Brody gets his first glimpse of the actual monster. You're going to need a bigger boat. Eventually, you have the final battle. The actual face-to-face -face confrontation with the shark. The heroes prevail, of course, otherwise this wouldn't be called overcoming the monster. <laughs> and the resolution, the happy ending, allows us to catch our breath and shows the heroes taking their victory lap. I used to hate the water. I can't imagine why. Now, let's look at rags to riches. Is there any greater irony than when an underdog battles the odds and becomes top dog? Rags to riches is all about someone who has been dealt a losing hand. Some of our most heartwarming tales from childhood center around a poor, unfortunate soul who will rise from the ashes. Not surprisingly, these tales often involve widows and orphans. Examples include Cinderella, Willy Wonka, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Little Orphan Annie, My Fair Lady, Pretty Woman, and this Charles Dickens classic, which won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1968. Oliver Twist is an orphan, an unloved little waif who lives in a cruel workhouse with other orphans, one day, they put him up to asking for more porridge. Please, sir. I want some. More? More? He gets punished for his insolence and locked up in the cellar. Oliver's call to action is when he realizes he can escape. He gets out of the cellar and makes his way to the big city of London. And that's where his adventure begins. An interesting thing about the mentors in this story, Oliver actually has several, beginning with this young fellow, a pickpocket known as the Artful Dodger. He takes Oliver under his wing and introduces him to Fagin, another gruff but lovable mentor who houses orphans and teaches them to be thieves for him. They are both flawed mentors who care more about themselves than our protagonist. Fortunately, there is a third mentor, Nancy, who tries to protect Oliver, and is a foreshadow of the love he will eventually find. Unfortunately, she is the girlfriend of the real villain of the story, the murderous Bill Sykes. In the tests and trials middle of the story, Oliver is falsely accused of pickpocketing and gets arrested. Later, he is kidnapped by Bill Sykes and forced to do his dangerous, dirty work. In the final confrontation, Bill Sykes is done away with, but Charles Dickens made sure it was not by Oliver's hand. If Oliver had killed him, he would no longer remain a true innocent, a sympathetic character in our eyes. And in the resolution, our happy ending, Oliver finally finds the love he had been missing when he is adopted by the very gentleman who had had him arrested for pickpocketing. It turns out he's a relative. A final touch of irony in our rags to riches story. Now let's look at The Quest, in which our hero seeks a treasure of great value. We all identify with the quest, because we all have goals, big and small, and we love to see our protagonist win the prize. The bigger the treasure, the more hurdles they'll have to jump to get there. Examples include Lord of the Rings, the Indiana Jones series, Treasure Island, Homer's Odyssey, and Jumanji. The Quest is especially popular with young adult readers these days, 
and much of the credit goes to the powerhouse series The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. In this dystopian tale, every year 24 teenagers are chosen at random to fight to the death. This brutal competition is to remind society of the devastation of war. Our hero in this story is Katniss Everdeen, and she shows she's a hero early on when her little sister is chosen to fight, and Katniss volunteers to take her place. In this call to action, Katniss saves the cat, as we say. So Katniss and a neighbor boy, Peta, will be among those fighting in this deadly challenge, and to help them prepare, they are assigned their very own mentor, a previous survivor of the Hunger Games. Unfortunately, it's this guy. Hamish is another flawed mentor, who's only there for the free drinks and food. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so when do we start? Oh, oh, so eager. Most of you aren't in such a hurry. Yeah, I want to know what the plan is. You're our mentor. You're supposed to go... Mentor? Yeah, our mentor. You're supposed to tell us how to get sponsors and give us advice. Oh, okay. Um, embrace the probability of your imminent death. And know in your heart that there's nothing I can do to save you. But Hamish will eventually come around and be lovable and helpful in his own way. The tests and trials portion of the story is, of course, the actual Hunger Games, with participants dying. Katniss herself isn't trying to kill anybody. She just does all she can to stay alive. Which isn't easy, facing fires, gangs, killer insects, and gamekeepers who throw their own deadly tests her way. In the final conflict, Katniss finds a way to outwit the Hunger Games and force them to change the rules. She becomes a popular symbol of resistance, much to the chagrin of the real villain of the series, the evil President Snow. Her victory is all the more sweet in the resolution when the President himself has to crown her the champion. Since it was published in 2008, The Hunger Games has become a game-changer and has inspired many more futuristic stories about young people and survival. Now let's look at Voyage and Return. The hero lands in unfamiliar territory and must learn new rules. Once again, we resonate with a hero who is put in a situation or a place that's foreign to them and requires a new skill set to succeed. In this basic plot, the hero's journey will take them far out of their comfort zone, but in time, they will return home triumphantly. Examples include Alice in Wonderland, Gulliver's Travels, Cast Away, the Back to the Future series, and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia. But I think the epitome of Voyage and Return and the hero's journey has to be The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy has two calls to action in this story, one that she has chosen and one that's chosen for her. First, when she thinks her dog Toto will be taken away from her, she decides to run away. But she has no control over the tornado that sweeps her away and forces her into the real voyage she must take. Soon, Dorothy finds herself in the magical land of Oz. There, she gets the best kind of mentor, one who is genuinely looking out for her. Glinda, the good witch, even has that spiritual quality we look up to. She gives Dorothy magic slippers and points the way to the Emerald City so she can return home. The tests and trials middle, or in this case the fun and games portion, sees Dorothy meeting her highly unusual traveling companions, who bear a striking similarity to some other traveling companions we know and love. 
she encounters apple-throwing trees, flying monkeys, and, of course, the Wicked Witch of the West. Ironically, their voyage isn't over when they finally reach their destination, the Emerald City. The Wizard of Oz gives them the biggest challenge of all. He tells them he will only grant their wishes if they bring him the broomstick of the Witch of the West. In the final fight, the witch is killed, and once again, not intentionally by our hero. Dorothy is just trying to put out a fire when she throws the bucket of water that melts the witch. And in the resolution, as we all know, Dorothy returns home, using the power that she had all along, and learning there's no place like home. Next we have comedy, a goal impeded by funny obstacles. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, couldn't any of these other basic plots be a comedy? Absolutely. In fact, more than likely, a comedy will encompass one or more of the other basic plots. But this one's all about the laughs. A comedy will center around humorous complications, misunderstandings, mistaken identities, maybe even physical comedy. Examples include those vacation movies with Chevy Chase, Home Alone, Mrs. Doubtfire, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and Shakespeare comedies like A Midsummer Night's Dream. In Groundhog Day, Bill Murray plays a jaded weatherman who was sent to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania against his will to cover Groundhog Day for the umpteenth time. When he gets there, through some miracle, He keeps waking up to the same day. This miracle is never explained, but because it's a comedy, we go with it. His call to action is when he realizes the same day keeps repeating. Once he gets past the confusion and frustration of reliving the same day with the same encounters, we get into the fun and games. At first, he takes advantage of the situation, revising different encounters to his own benefit and amusement. When he starts to fall in love with his producer, Rita, he uses things he learned about her the day before to trick her into thinking he's the kind of guy she goes for. Eventually, he experiences a personal transformation and uses his repeating days to build positive connections and help others. So who is the mentor in this story? You could actually say it's Rita, his love interest, She is the moral compass of the story, who shows him that he can be a better person. The victory in this story is when Bill wakes up and it's no longer the same day. He has moved on, and he has a new outlook on life. It turns out the battle was within himself, and he has won. You could call this a voyage and return romantic comedy. And by the way, if you need some explanation as to why he kept waking up to the same day, in the original script, he had an ex-girlfriend who placed a curse on him. Now we come to tragedy. The hero is their own worst enemy. Like comedy, this can involve one or more of the other basic plots, but it's a very different animal. Don't expect a happy ending. In a tragedy, you put your hero up a tree throw rocks at him for 200 pages, and it kills him. Either the hero or someone he cares about is going to die. It won't always be a literal death. It can be the death of their dream, the death of hope, a devastating loss of some kind. These are usually morality plays in which the hero causes their own downfall. Examples include Macbeth, Citizen Kane, Hamilton, The Great Gatsby, and the picture of Dorian Gray. For our example, we have one of the most tragic stories ever told. But it's a musical. As we know, West Side Story is a modernized version of Romeo and Juliet, 
complete with a balcony scene. And like many classic love stories, there's a backdrop of war. In this case, gang wars. But because it's a romance, the call to action is really when Tony and Maria first lay eyes on each other at a dance. That's when the real complications begin, since Italians and Puerto Ricans are natural enemies, apparently. There's plenty of street fighting and conflict in the tests and trials middle, and this is where we meet the mentor. If you're familiar with the story, you might think the mentor is Maria's sister-in-law, telling her how dangerous this romance is. But she's as prejudiced as anyone, telling her to stick to her own kind. The actual mentor is this guy, Doc, who runs the local drugstore. He mostly belly aches and tells the kids to stop fighting. He's not a very effective mentor, which, in a tragedy, kind of makes sense, because they're not going to listen to him anyway. Ultimately, there is a final confrontation and a death. As far as a resolution, there is no happy ending, but there is some reflection, some remorse, and maybe even some lessons learned as everyone stops to consider what their bad choices have brought about. Finally, we come to Rebirth, in which the hero transforms into a new being, literally or figuratively. We see these transformations in such stories as The Frog Prince, A Christmas Carol, Beauty and the Beast, The Beast Transforms, Heaven Can Wait, A Man Called Otto, and all those other grumpy old man changes his ways stories. To illustrate Rebirth, here's a story most of us have seen multiple times. In It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey is the good person we all want to be. He's a kind-hearted everyman who makes endless sacrifices for the benefit of others. Everyone loves George. His call to action is when everything in George's life falls apart through no fault of his own. He's in financial ruin, and he finds himself on a bridge contemplating ending it all. Who comes along? but a mentor, George's guardian angel, who tries to convince George that it's a wonderful life. Yeah, so you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, right? Eh? I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Oh, you mustn't say things like that. You... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. George gets his wish and the fun and games ensue. Since he had never been born, all of the good deeds he had done in his life no longer happened, to the detriment of everyone. The town is now run by the villain of the story, Mr. Potter, because George wasn't there to prevent it. None of his friends or family know him, and he finally understands how much his life mattered after all. Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Clarence, please! Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again! Please, God, let me live again! In a supremely happy ending, everyone George has ever helped come to his aid and make things right again. And his guardian angel Clarence gets his wings. George once was lost, but now he has hope with help from above. And we can all identify with that. So there's your seven basic plots, the things that make them different, and the things they have in common. Again, many stories involve crossover of multiple plots. And it's your own creativity that will turn these established themes into brand new stories. Now, even if you don't start out intending to write a story about rags to riches or a quest, it's probably going to become one of these basic plots without you even trying. Once you can identify which of these basic plots you're actually writing in, you'll have a better grasp of the real theme of your story. Maybe it's moral, as well as the elements to help you put the storyline together. There are many approaches to storytelling, and the seven basic plots is just one of them. 
Of course, you can just wing it. There's no law that says you have to incorporate any of this. These are not rules as much as principles. And to quote author coach Robert McKee, a rule says you must do it this way. A principle says this works and has through all remembered time. Why reinvent the wheel when it's already been smoothed over for you?